Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology webinar hosted by Texas Instruments. For tonight, we're going to take a look at differentiation through blended learning. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI Technology to make tough to teach, tough to learn concepts accessible to all my students. Tonight, we're lucky to be joined by our panelists. Ariel Taylor. So Ariel is a new TQ instructor and is excited to serve teachers near and far with integrating technology into their blended learning classrooms. She's been an educator for 10 years and is currently a professor at the University of Texas at Austin in the UTeach College of Natural Sciences Department. Ariel is the author of Party of Four Please, a standards-based approach to differentiation through blended learning. Ariel, it's great to have you with us tonight. Hi, Mike. It's so good to be here. We're expecting a large crowd, so your audio is muted. Feel free at any time to send questions to Ariel using the Q&A window on the right side of your screen. We'll also be using the chat window to send general messages. As a reminder, this session is being recorded, and we'll provide a link to the event certificate of attendance at the conclusion of the webinar. We hope you don't have any audio issues tonight, but in the event that you do, try selecting uh, audio broadcast from the audio menu at the very top of the WebEx menu and choose play. At this point, I'm going to give Ariel control. So Ariel, you have control. Feel free to share your screen and don't forget to unmute yourself. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mike. This is very exciting. I'm so happy to be here, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and share my um, PowerPoint with you all. Uh, but before I get into the PowerPoint, I wanted to show you something that I learned not too long ago. PowerPoint has integrated this feature where you can show subtitles. I can show subtitles in so many different languages. I'm going to make sure they're on English for tonight. And I'm going to go ahead and play from the start. All right, so like Mike said, my name is Dr. Ariel Taylor, and I am here to speak to you about differentiation through blended learning. Whether you're in a virtual space or if you're in person or you're doing a combination, which would then truly be blended learning, we're going to talk about some strategies that you can implement in your classrooms for today. The agenda for today, we're going to, like, first off, where am I coming from? Who is this lady? Um, what is some background information? So I'm going to go a little bit about who I am and what my thoughts are and how they've become, um, you know, what they are. And then we'll get into understanding differentiation. This is this word that's just been thrown around a lot lately. And so getting a true understanding of what that is. And then I'm going to introduce you to the restaurant classroom model. We're going to look at the what, the why, and, of course, the how, and leverage some TI classroom activities in, um, on the TI website. At the end of this session, you all will be able to uh, have new strategies that you can implement in your classroom tomorrow. And we're going to discuss how to leverage TI technology as students choose their own path and their own place and their own pace of their learning. And um, of course, we're going to be introduced into the blended learning classroom model, explore those activities that are in the TI classroom, as well as the blend, uh, the building concept activities. And then finally, we'll discuss how to incorporate these into a virtual le uh, lesson plan. So I'll give you two examples of lesson plans that I have used in my own classroom that have been very powerful in this virtual space. I am the author of Party of Four, Please, a standards-based approach to differentiation through blended learning. And uh, that's a whole bunch. That's like a whole mouthful. And basically, what the book is about is when you take your standards, you truly understand them, and you give a standards-based approach to ensuring that all of your students are learning all the time at their very own pace, in their own place, and on their own path. Um, and, and we're going to do this through the vehicle of blended learning by leveraging activities and technology with you as the instructor and the facilitator of the learning process. 
So before we get deeply in, involved in the whole restaurant classroom idea, I wanted to first just tell you a little bit more about me. Um, I am from a very small town south of Houston, Texas. If I told you the name, you probably wouldn't know, but I love representing my city. So I'm from Warden, Texas, um, and there's like a home of 9,000 people. So I've had the opportunity to grow up uh, across the street from horses and cows. And when I came to the University of Texas at Austin for my bachelor's degree, I was absolutely overwhelmed and shocked by everything around me. I didn't realize that they had city buses on campus. There was just so much um, information and, and so much out there that I just didn't know about. And so from my experiences at, at UT, I uh, learned that I, I couldn't do it on my own. I really needed to lean and depend on the support of people around me and in order to learn as much as I could. I've spent a couple years teaching in Corpus Christi, in Austin, in Houston, just traveling around Texas and teaching in different size schools so that I can get a true understanding of all the needs or as many needs as I could from students who are in real Texas schools. And so um, teaching at small schools, teaching at large schools, I did learn that there was one major issue that was common in all of them. And that issue was, it was so hard for me to teach everybody at the same time in this one size fits all model. It just wasn't gonna happen. And I came through you teach and we are priding ourselves on the 5E model, engage, explore, explain, elaborate, evaluate. And y'all, at the end of the day, all I could say was I was exhausted. So it was a 6E model for me. So I'm thinking, okay, I want to be able to do all these great things that I was trained to do, but how can I do that if I'm just going to be exhausted? And that was when I realized that I was doing it all wrong. I was trying to be everything for everybody and not really leveraging the students and their abilities on themselves. So when my the uh, the teachers came around and the principals came around for a new school year and they said, hey, guys, this year we're going to focus on differentiation. And I'm like, okay, here's another thing. But then when, once I truly understood what it was, it truly changed my life. And so this understanding that I'm coming from is to an opportunity to not hinder the learning process of our students. Um, I had to stop asking my students to operate as an Army militia. They didn't have to do everything at the same time, start and stop when I say, okay, everybody, it's time for the warm-up. Warm-up's over, bell just rang, now it's time. I was like, okay, this is clearly not working um, because it wasn't, the, it wasn't optimizing and it wasn't as efficient and effective as I knew my students could be and as well as I knew my teaching could be. So I had to understand that my students didn't have to all work on the same materials at the same time, and they didn't even have to use the same methods. What? Yeah, that was the true understanding and the birth of the restaurant classroom. Now, differentiation, some people may say, what is that? That's a long word. I mean, I see the different part in it, in the chichiation, I don't know. Well, truly differentiation is not that difficult. It's probably something you're already doing in your classroom. You're probably already doing it and have been doing it for a very long time. But there's a way to optimize our learning through differentiation when we really take some time to think about what it is. It's just doing what's best for each and every one of your students. It's making lessons and designing the implementation so that the results are gonna actually change what you're doing with your students. So you, I know you've heard of formative assessment. It's an opportunity to have these learning outcomes help you to form new opportunities. And we're kind of moving away from this one size fits all model where it's like not some, but truly all. We have to, true, to teach all of our students and not just some of them. So the restaurant classroom, what the heck is that? Well, I think it was about my fourth year teaching, and I was like, yeah, this exhaustion is for real. What am I going to do? And uh, it, was, it was an opportunity for me just to, like, get away. I was single. I didn't have any kids. 
and I frequented restaurants. I didn't have, I didn't really like to cook. I still don't like to cook. So yeah. But anyway, I, I would go to restaurants and I'd start um, staring at the menu, trying to figure out what I wanted to eat. And now, mind you, an aside real quick, I've traveled a lot of different places, went to a lot of different conferences, trying to figure out the answer to my question of how do I teach all of my students at the same time. And what I found out was that this way the restaurant is modeled, I could kind of pull that into my classroom. So if you think about it, when you get to a restaurant, the first person you see is the hostess. And that hostess is going to kind of set the tone for you and, and say, you know, welcome to ABC Restaurant. And she's going to ask you how many people in your party. At that moment, you either like that restaurant or you don't. Have you ever been to a restaurant where you go and the, and the hostess has this bad attitude like, yeah, how many people would? I need you to like greet me. And one of the first things I learned as a uh, educator in, in, in school was I had to greet my students at the door. I had to make sure that my students were happy to be there, knew that I was happy to be there, and they felt welcome. And so that alone really helps me to see the connection between my classroom and a restaurant. So teachers, teachers um, serve a role here as a facilitator, a hostess, a waiter, and the chef. And the students are gonna be the patrons or the participants in the restaurant. So let's keep going with that model. We have this idea where you have the hostess and she welcomes you and she makes you feel good about being in this space and, um, and you feel welcome. She's gonna ask them how many students are in your party. I'm sorry, not how many students are in your party, how many people are in your party at the restaurant. And sometimes you just feel like eating alone so you can have a party of one. Or sometimes you're in a whole big party celebrating a birthday or something. And maybe you're a party of 10. Or with this COVID situation, we know we can't be a party of 10, maybe a party of six at the most. But what if we gave our students the same opportunity to tell you what they're feeling that day? Maybe they do want to work alone. Or maybe they want to work in a party of four or a party of 10. No, that's scary because when teachers um, are taught about grouping strategies, we usually say maximize it at three, three is effective, four at the most. But I would like to challenge you to think about allowing students to work in larger groups. What are the pros and cons of that? I use this in my classroom and I found that when students work in larger groups, that sometimes, yeah, they may get a little distracted, but if they get to choose those groups, and they, oh man, I'm speaking choice. We're gonna come back to that. Um, but if they get to choose their groups and they get to have this feeling of expectation, but also welcome, then it's a lot better than you would even imagine. So again, now we have this teacher kind of telling the students, welcome, how many in your party? They bring them in. And the first thing you're gonna, they're gonna do is they're gonna sit you down and allow you to get acclimated to the space before the waiter comes over. So now the teacher is going to serve the purpose of the waiter. I know you've all went to a restaurant and you're asking um, the waiter some questions and she first asks you maybe what you want to drink. And then when it's time, she, she asks you, okay, are you ready? Have you had an opportunity to look over the menu? And you have so many choices in front of you where you can make a decision as to how you want to digest the day's material. So those are called a menu of opportunity, but sometimes they're called choice boards providing our students with a menu of different things that they can do in order for them to achieve the goals that we have for them is gonna be really important. But let's think about that restaurant, going back to the restaurant. If you go into a restaurant and you have a teacher, I'm sorry, a waiter, who you ask a question like, um, how, how is the baked potato? And she has no clue. That means you're probably not gonna eat the baked potato. Or you ask her what is her favorite meal, or you ask her many questions to get an understanding of the menu. If she doesn't know, then that's not going to be great. So that is where the teacher has to be knowledgeable. That is why we know our content. We know our power standards. We actually can understand and break down the material that we're going to be teaching our students so that 
when they ask us questions, we're able to articulate the best path for them. Um, especially sometimes the waiter will ask me, well, are you really hungry? Or um, what are you feeling? And so now they can tailor my needs to what, I, what I'm telling them. And so, um, of course, in this restaurant model, we want our students to be full. We want them to reach the goals that we set out for them to do it according to our standards. So we have to provide them with a full course meal. In this case, we call the soup. You know how they offer you a soup at the very beginning or bread. That's going to be your engagement. That's going to be an opportunity for students to um, hear and be excited about what, what is going to happen for the rest of that class period. And maybe it's just a little dabble. It, can, it may not be something super deep, but just an opportunity to say, hey, let's look right here and see what, let, let's see what today is going to bring us. And, um, and it's a great opportunity as an entry ticket to kind of see what your students are also bringing in to the classroom. The appetizer, maybe these are shareable experiences. We're getting hands, like we're getting in um, hands on. So exploration, an opportunity for you to explore and kind of see what you know, make a common experience for everybody at the table. So. Um, in the 5B model, we really go a lot on the inquiry-based learning. And so when you think about inquiry-based learning, it's hard to give a student or ask a student a question about an experience that they have no clue about. Remember earlier I told y'all that I was from a rural community south of Texas, and I remember on my SAT questions, one of them asked me about ski slopes. Y'all had never seen ski, uh, snow, and I dang sure hadn't skied. So if this was the case and this is what I was going to be asked, I was like, um, let me just put this in my, like, let, let me put this in my head and try to make sense of it. But we shouldn't have to do that. So in exploration, you try to give your students a common experience that everyone will be able to co communicate about. And then the salad is going to be that explanation. So explanation is where you're going to have, give your students an opportunity to share what it is that they just learned from the exploration. So an opportunity to talk, an opportunity for the students to lead the conversation. Um, there was a time in my teaching experience where the administration was really focused on this, this key word of student-centered instruction, student-centered instruction, student-centered instruction. What does that mean? What does that look like? And I think an explanation where students are leading the conversation and they're the first to talk is really what that student-centered um, instruction is all about. And that main course, most people would think that the main course is probably the exploration, but no, the main course is actually going to be the elaboration, the opportunity to dig deeper. So an opportunity for your students to not only have they been engaged and maybe they dabbled a little bit to figure things out, give you a little bit of what they know so we can figure out formatively what we need to do. And then we have had the opportunity to explore and look around, have a hands on experience, um, common experience where everyone can now bring, a, bring to a conversation and discussion the explanation. Then as a teacher, I can come and say, now that you know this and now that you've been able to explain this, Let's dig a little bit deeper in the elaboration. And the dessert, of course, is the evaluation. Show me what you know. Show me how you have been able to digest the material that we've provided you in these bite-sized portions. And of course, the waitress is always going to come back and ask you, um, would you like a refill? Uh, do you need anything? Um, and the, that particular part represents our assistance or our feedback. Now, remember, sometimes you get limited refills at a restaurant. So for your teacher just to be coming over there all the time, that's not expected, um, especially because sometimes students, we want them to lean and depend on each other. So if they're working in a party of four, then we want that collaboration piece to happen, and all of them have to let us know before we come back over to the table and help them out with their work. So that's the restaurant classroom model, and hopefully I've done an okay job of explaining the parallels between a classroom and a restaurant and how we can look at them 
to be a successful experience for our students to digest material. There are a few rules in, this, in the restaurant classroom. The first rule is to set the tone. Remember we talked about the, the um, hostess, how that hostess sets the tone. In our classrooms, especially in blended learning spaces, we have to set the tone, set our expectations, allow our students to feel and know that they are, um, that they are part of this learning process and that we're going to hold them accountable for something. Rule number two is to allow for flexibility. Now more than ever, we must be flexible. You all, I'm sure, have experienced things this semester alone that have not gone exactly to your plan. Um, my cousin, when I, I was stressed out one time, and she was just like, Ariel, what is going on with you? And I said, oh my gosh, like everything in life is just doing its own thing, and I don't feel like I have control, and I just, I'm struggling. And she said, I know you, um, you've probably read all these rules, and you probably know the Beatitudes about blessed are this person, but I'm going to give you a new one. And I said, what is this, Shishi? Her name is Shishi. She said, blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be bent out of shape. And I had to sit with that for a little while, and I thought about it. And this is so true. You can't be bent out of shape if you're flexible. So when your students have an issue that you don't quite expect them to have, or when your students come up with something that you didn't expect to come up, just be flexible. And that is going to be a game changer, especially in this blended learning space. Um, it's, when it comes to technology and using different technology in our classroom, we definitely have to be flexible. In a little bit, we're going to go onto the TI website and going to look at some of the classroom activities that are there for us to use, and we're going to talk a little bit more about flexibility in, from the standpoint of using the TI activities. Rule number three is um, choice. Choice makes the difference. And the, le uh, the level or the degree that you actually give choice in your classroom is totally up to you, but I would say that providing your students the opportunity to choose who they work with or choose the activity that they're going to use in their path and their place and their pace, then that is going to make a huge difference when it comes to making effective blended learning practices. Rule number four, be knowledgeable. Remember that, that um, waitress who doesn't know the menu for the day or she doesn't know what's good on the menu or the size portions. Um, and the difference is between a small and a regular, you don't even want it. You want a new waitress because that waitress is not providing you with what you need. As, as instructors, we must be knowledgeable. We need to know our standards and we need to truly understand how they're interconnected, both horizontally and vertically. And by horizontally, I mean what's coming next in the class um, and vertically, what did the students learn prior and what are they going to learn in the future? And so once you know all of those things, you're able to better facilitate the learning process. Another one of my favorite analogies in, the term, in terms of be knowledgeable is about driving a car and making sure that your students have the knowledge um, and, and you serving as the navigator of that car. So students are driving their own vehicles and you are serving as the navigation system. And as a navigation system, you're providing each of your students with a direction and an opportunity for them to know when a pothole is coming or when there's a roadblock or a detour because you are knowledgeable about where they're trying to go and how they're going to get there. Rule number five is be mobile. This one is if you're in a classroom and you're um, having your students, of course, we're social distancing now, so being mobile is important for you to be able to see where your students are and where they're struggling. Don't sit at the desk, of course walk around, see what they're doing. But I think on a virtual space, it's even more important. When we put our students in breakout rooms, to pop in, pop out, go around. When they see that you're coming, they know that they can ask you questions and they can lean and depend on your expertise to help facilitate their learning process. So being mobile, very important. Now, somebody may be thinking, this lady is just talking, talking, talking about the restaurant, classroom, 
why do we need to do all of that? Can I just teach my lesson and stand where I need to stand and make, make it do what it needs to do since I've been doing this for so long? And I'm here to tell you why. There's this thing called the zone of proximal development. You probably heard of Vygotsky when you were in your education courses. And Vygotsky talks a lot about this opportunity for students to capitalize on their learning at a very particular part point. Well, when learning is too easy, it's boring. But if learning is too hard, you can have some type of anxiety. And so the zone of proximal development is going to allow your students to learn where it's best for them. It's going to allow them to pick and choose and understand what is best and what is going to be most helpful for them. So I remember talking to you a little bit about standards-based instruction. Standards-based instruction provides you a, a framework for your students to learn um, and, and, and communicate with you where they are, whether they're developing, proficient, or advanced, your students are able to, to tell you what types of activities they will need to do in order for them to be learning in their zone of proximal development. Carolyn is like one of the top gurus when it comes to differentiation. And she talks about how you can differentiate different parts of your lesson. You can dis differentiate the content. That's where we look at what students need to learn or how students will get the access to the information. And then we have, we can differentiate the process. Activities in which students engage um, in order to make sense of the content or master the content. So we can definitely differ differentiate the process that they're going to learn in. And of course, we can differentiate the products. So what our students do, um, how will they actually learn the material? What will they show us that they, they learn the material using? That's how you differentiate the products. And of course, the learning environment. We can differentiate the way the classroom works and feels. This has been one of the craziest times pretty much of my life. So, yeah, I would say that that's true. <laughs> so in 2020, well, prior to 2020, I was all in the differentiation and blended learning and trying to learn how, um, how this works in the classroom, how can I best help my students. And a lot of the information was talking about flipped classrooms and and um, differentiation and breaking down the material where your students didn't have to sit in desk or they could sit in flexible seating and flexible grouping. Um, and there were some people who weren't necessarily on board with it. But I think 2020 has given us all a new opportunity to see that a lot of the things that we said initially were not possible are definitely possible. They are possible and not only possible, but they are also productive and effective. And so I really want to take some time to hear if there's anything in the chat right now, Mike, um, so that we can engage some of the conversation. So Ariel, um, there's one thing that uh, stuck out to me whenever I was looking back to the chat uh, was from uh, Kiki. And Kiki was just wondering, like, you know, adapting this to a virtual learning environment, I, I think is definitely going to be a challenge. And I know you're, you're speaking to some of that already. Um, what do you think are just you know, some of the most difficult things that teachers are going to find trying to differentiate and have their, you know, learning be blended in a virtual setting? Really great question, Mike. Um, I believe the, the part that's going to be most difficult would be you, which, learning which tools to use. At this point in the game, we've been inundated with so many ed tech resources and all of these different strategies that people are saying, hey, I'm using this and I'm using that. And um, it's, it's a little bit overwhelming, especially if you're new to using ed tech in your classroom. And so I'd say basically just taking our time and figuring out two to five strategies that you want to incorporate and just sticking with those would be the most important thing to do when it comes to differentiating in the, in the blended learning classroom. Um, this this whole restaurant classroom idea, 
I don't think it's new. And I don't think it's something that, oh, Ariel came up with and, and, and coined it. Um, I think it's just an, up, an opportunity to see our classrooms in a different light. And at first I was thinking prior to COVID, I only saw this happening where I was in the classroom and I was online and I was, you know, leveraging um, technology outside of the, of the classroom only as like maybe a flipped classroom model or using students to do homework on um, quizzes or Kahoot or whatever you have you. And then coming back into class and really depending on the in-class model, especially with this whole idea that I'm the hostess and my students sit together and all of that. Um, but over this semester, I've really had the opportunity to just sit back and actually not sit back. That's not the right word. I've had the opportunity to get dirty with it, actually, like get down and find out what what ways I could utilize this model virtually. And I'd say welcoming my students to the space has been absolutely necessary and it's looked different different now. Um, I do a circle before every class. When I welcome them in, I ask them questions about their day. I ask them questions about the world um, and, and just things that may be going on. For example, today in class, I ask, um, what is one thing that you wish your professor knew? And I asked it on a Google form. And a lot of my students responded with things that shook my heart. They answered questions. Um, they answered the question by saying, I wish my teacher knew that I deal with depression and anxiety. I wish my teacher knew that sometimes I get stressed out and I have to step away. These are things that I hadn't gotten in the past in, my, in the physical classroom, but virtually I think it's important for us to sit back and think about how we're setting the tone in our classroom and what ways that we can make that possible um, by not just digging into the mathematics or the science, but really thinking about our students as people. And then when it comes to providing our students with different opportunities for the engagement, the exploration and all of that, um, in just a few slides, I'm gonna show you some examples of how I do this and utilizing breakout rooms to really help with the collaboration piece and putting students in different spaces so that they can lean and depend on each other and still providing exploration opportunities for our students to um, use the TI, the TI activities so that they can still visualize and um, help them make connections. For one example that I, I can speak to from my math class this semester, um, we wanted to look at the connection between the Pythagorean theorem, the distance formula, and the equation of a circle. And we were able to use the TI calculator to really help our students connect those ideas and see that they're in actuality all the same. And through that exploration, our students were able to see something that they had never even thought of and build a connection and, under, and make an understanding of a concept. Um, but in a virtual space where we would think that that probably would be more difficult. Mike, is that, are there any other questions in the chat? Um, I, think that's, I think that's it for now. Awesome, thank you. All right, so we talked about like what the restaurant classroom is. Um, I tr tried to give a brief overview of it. Um, and then we talked about kind of like, why do we even want to do this and understanding that there is definitely research that says differentiation is important. Not only is it important, but it's ideal. Not only is it ideal, but it's necessary. It is necessary to ensure that all of our students learn and so like when I was first starting out, um, one of the fundamental questions that they asked us was, do we believe all students can learn? And I'm like, yeah, of course, whoever doesn't believe that shouldn't be a teacher. And I think that fundamental belief and the realization that not all my students were learning was a turning point in my educational career. It was a turning point for me and it was very disappointing Maybe you all have heard of the, the phases of a first year teacher, um, but when you hit that disillusionment stage and you realize 
that you're spinning your wheels and you're exhausted at the end of the day, and when you get to the test, over half of your students did not meet the objective, you have to figure out something different to do. Like, you, you there's no... There's no complacency within us as educators that is going to allow us to just sit back and say our students aren't learning, but at least I taught it. No, that means you said it. You didn't teach it because they didn't learn it. <laughs> so I had to figure out how. I knew that it had to happen. I knew the why, but I didn't understand how. So I started creating some menu of options. Um, the one on the left is the functions model that I used um, when I was teaching Algebra 1. And in Texas, we use what we call TEKS. That's the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills. Of course, everyone has their own standards. Some of you are maybe on the Common Core. And um, you have the opportunity to write the standard at the top. And we want, and that's the special of the day. That's what everybody has to have. It, you have to have that, right? <laughs> so on the menu, that's, that's listed as our special. And then for our soups, remember I said that those were my engagements. So I would list the engagements out um, and give an option for our students. Either they would do the sneak peek or they would do the does it exist. And it kind of tells you what type of activity this is. So the WS here stands for a worksheet. And kinesthetic, it's for people who like to work with their hands um, and make something. Developmental means a student who's just developing on this concept should be able to do this. And then um, it gives a little bit of overview of what it's about. It's about swimming and purchasing tickets. And then here we have the worksheet. It's a visual activity and it's development. It's, it's a developing activity on that level for standards-based learners. And direct means it, it deals directly with numbers and um, variables. And so it doesn't necessarily have a context behind it. So during doing this type of layout for my for my menus was really helpful for my students because they were able to see and understand the coding um, because this was a routine that we used. So they would make choices on their menus given the knowledge that I, was, I presented on it. So then the appetizers, this is where the students actually get to explore together how they want to do activities. Again, a CS is a card sort. It's a visual activity for visual learners to see what's going on. And then this one, again, is for, for developing students. So as you move throughout this activity, you'll see developing, proficient, advanced, um, and different types of activities and, and different learning styles. And the drinks I offered them, Dr. T, that was me. And I would come over with limited refills to provide them with some instruction. And over here we have the blended learning station rotation learning plan. This one is the model that I'm using now in my classroom. And it has my learning target at the top, the directions for our students as to what they have to do at the completion of each station. Um, this one is actually set up for, um, for a PD. So this is not an example from my classroom, but I definitely can send you some if you hit me on Twitter. Um, my Twitter name is at the bottom of the slide, Dr. Ariel J. Taylor, or you can send me an email. Um, but we have here direct teacher. So I'm in one station and I provide my students with direct instruction and an ability for them to ask questions. So this is me being mobile. I'm actually staying in one spot and that sounds counterintuitive, but um, I'm, I'm in one spot where all students are going to see me in a rotation. And um, then we have our independent learning, and this is usually utilizing some tech tool. And so here, I would usually have my students doing a TI activity together, and, um, and maybe I have a QR code that's linking it or some type of link that they can use to, to access it. And then um, another another station is usually there to, for them to watch a video of maybe another instructor or of me, and I'm explaining what it is that they need to understand, and, and they're answering questions, maybe using Edpuzzle or um, uh, any other tool that's out there where they can engage with a video. <laughs> and then um, collaborative station. 
this is where the students are working together. And they, so, so basically you've had an opportunity to, to meet with the teacher and talk to her and find out, you know, ask questions maybe about yesterday or tomorrow or what's going on right now. And, and you had two independent learning stations where they weren't truly independent because you had someone to help you, whether that be um, me on a video or someone else on a video or the TI calculator and, and the strategies that we've laid out for you to use to visualize the instruction. And then the collaborative station is where you're working together in pairs or partners or in larger groups to, to do an activity together. And then we come through at the very end and we're showing our assessment, which is usually a three, two, one of each of the stations. So three things that I learned, two things that I may be confused about or um, I'm excited about. So I, I change that prompt quite often. And then the one question that I have. And in our wrap up of our lesson, we always talk about, you know, what are those questions and we give students opportunities to answer them for each other. And we use Google Jamboard or, or some type of collaborative piece like Flipgrid for them to answer each other's questions. And then the teacher will come through and answer any leftover questions. So I want to take a moment and allow people to put in the chat if they have any questions about these models that I'm showing on how you can use station rotation and, and differentiation and blended learning. So, Ariel, we're getting a couple questions about just, um, you know, obviously I think creating something like this, the menu, uh, is going to take a little bit of time. And so, any recommendations for, uh, you know, a teacher that likes this, loves it, wants to use it, uh, but hasn't done this yet, um, you know, how should they start incorporating this into their year and their, their lessons? Really great question. I would say, Utilizing Canvas is, um, I'm sorry, not Canvas, Canva is how I, what the program I use to help create the actual menu. Um, and then I actually have some resources that I will send out. I'm, I didn't think about that initially. I'm sorry, Mike. Um, but I can send out some resources as to how you lay out your different activities and then you put them together in a menu and it, it makes it a lot easier to do and, and you can put links in. It's, it's similar to a lesson plan, but it has an opportunity for you to put activities together. I will say that I didn't make these alone. I, I lean heavily upon my um, PLC, especially when I taught Algebra 1. And so everybody has their favorite activity that they wanted. And usually, like, we used to have to choose one activity that we were going to do. But when we started using this restaurant classroom model, we no longer had to choose one activity. We would put them all on there and allow our students to choose which one they wanted to use to help um, meet the objectives. Perfect. Thanks so much. No problem. Is there any other question right now? Um, there was a question from Abby about how long does it take to complete these activities? Um, is that the, if, so I'll answer the two questions that are in my head. Um, if there, if you're talking about actually making the menus, you get a lot faster as time goes. And of course, if you have a PLC to lean on, lean on, then it becomes a lot faster in that respect as well. Making the menu, I've gotten it down to about an hour. Um, I can make a full menu and a menu does not equate to one class period. A menu sometimes can be a complete unit, and um, it's really helpful when you have one document that's going to take your students a few days and allow them to engage in the content for the, the duration of, of the period you need. Um, and so I guess that kind of answers the second question. If, if the question was regarding how long it takes a student to complete the menu, it's all based on the pacing guide of my of my school. So if I had three days to cover functions, then we usually would do that and, and set it up for three days. Um, when I became a lot more risky, a risk taker, then I allowed my students to continue working um, at their own pace for sure. And so what that looked like for my classroom was some students would be on functions where others may be on probability. And they were all doing what they needed to do in their own pace. And that's where I felt that I had the most, the most uh, positive outcome. So it is, 
it was really amazing to help create these these documents and help our um, and in the PLC help our our fellow teachers understand the the model and the process of doing this. And so I just wanted to share that with y'all. The first thing is you want to decide which standard or TEAK you're going to be teaching and truly unpack it and understand it, making sure that you have those standards, um, the standard-based learning aligned and, and to where you know what developing students should be able to do if they're going to meet that standard, what proficient students will be able to do and what advanced students will be able to do. And so then you gather all the materials and pull materials from various resources, and this is where you can go to the Texas Instruments Classroom Activities website as a source and use those activities in your menu creation. And then, of course, you want to organize your menu in a way that it, it allows your students to know what's going on, keeping our students in the loop. Usually, we don't show students lesson plans. We don't show students grade books, of course. Um, we just give them what we know is necessary. But I think showing your students their navigation and allowing or showing them your students, so, uh, showing the students your menu and allowing them to make informed decisions is a vital piece of this process. And so writing down what type of activity it is, what learning style it adheres to, um, and understanding the proficiency level for the students to, to see where they are at all times, it's been really powerful. And then um, finally, just assigning it and making it, you know, making the menu or the choice board or the station rotation, I utilize Canva to do most of mine. There are four questions that drive my instruction. You may have heard of these questions before. They are not new to me. Um, these questions came from Rick DeFore and Solution Tree, and they, they really were the understanding of a PLC. What do we want our students to learn? How will we know if they learned it? Um, what will we do if they don't learn it? And on the other side of that, what will we do if they already know it? So I want to address these questions, but I see some action in the chat. So I'm going to come back to you, Mike. Thanks. Yeah, we definitely have um, some questions. Uh, Claudia asks, um, are your assessments based on the standards? So is it standards-based assessments? Absolutely. Absolutely. So all of my standards, I'm, I'm sorry, all of my assessments are standards-based, and they are going to be addressing the menu directly. So we, we take our entire curriculum for Algebra 1, and we divide it into what we call power standards. And those power standards allow us to chunk common material. So the idea of functions, functions is called a power standard. And so all of the TEKS and all of the standards that are related to functions is under that one standard. Then we may have a power standard called scatter plots or a power standard called domain and range. In biology, you may have um, you may have power standards specifically for cell reproduction or specifically for, you know, di different major concepts that appear in the, in the content. And so once you have your power standards, you make assessments based on your power standards. And if a student were to take a test and they are taking an assessment over functions, but it may include scatter plots, then that test is going to de delineate this these this section of the test is about functions. This section of the test is about uh, scatter plots, and is directly aligned with the menu. Great. And a lot of people are asking uh, as well about: um, Do your students take summative assessments at different times? And so, would that mean that you would need to write multiple assessments, or how do you do that? I knew this question was going to come, and it is. It's a radical answer. So, so for some tests, so for some exams, like benchmark exams, all students take those at the same time, and we ensure that all of our units are covered. Um, that are like if it's if three power standards going to be covered on that benchmark, we ensure that all students have gotten through those benchmarks. Um, I'm sorry, through those units before that benchmark assessment has come. And those are our common assessments that we give maybe across district or across campus. And then my own personal test, like my teacher test, 
I use this model where it's called number three pencils allowed. This is the alternative assessment. And so I don't have this sit down, take this multiple choice exam where I don't have to make multiple different versions. I actually have an opportunity for students to show me what they know. But I feel like if I get in deeply into that, it's going to be an extra hour. So I'm sorry. But yes, all of our students take tests at the same time. And we do handle that in the way where we make sure that they've covered all the menus necessary for that benchmark. But the summative assessments that are throughout the class that are just mine alone, they don't look the same as a traditional exam. Thanks so much. And maybe uh, people can reach out to you uh, on Twitter to kind of get more information. Absolutely. Um, and Joe, I saw Jody's question. It's called alternative assessments. That's what you'll find if you do research, but I called my number three pencils allowed, and that's because I never knew what a number two pencil was because I'd never heard of a number one pencil, and so I just played off of it, and I went with number three pencils. <laughs> Mike, are there any other questions in the chat? Um, I don't believe so. Uh, I'm going to take right, another perfect. hard look at that. Okay, well, I'll take some time to just go over leveraging these TI activities. We have a few minutes left. so. There's this building concept section of the website, and it is amazing. I did not know it existed um, until recently, and now that I've seen it, I just am in love with it. So if you're like me and you, you've never dealt with the building concept section of the TI website, then you're in for a treat if you get an opportunity to explore it. So building concepts provides a lot of activities, and um, and learning experiences across grade levels. And so there are learning sequences for the different grade levels in the middle grades, right? And, and there's different strands. So you can pick a topic like expressions and equations, um, fractions, ratios, proportions, uh, statistics, and probability. So let's just say we're teaching a lesson on like linear regression. So you can choose statistics and probability. And this is going to take you from like sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade understanding of intro to probability. There are 24 activities that you can choose from um, all the way into two very two way tables and categorical data. And it, it covers so much in the range of statistical, um, I'm sorry, statistics and probability. I use these a lot for developing understanding. Um, because it truly allows students to target those misconceptions and make new understanding and build connections on these concepts. You can choose the grade level, choose the standard. So they have the Common Core and also the TEKS. So if you were to click on one of these, it's pretty amazing because it gives you a lesson snapshot. It tells you what the students should be doing, what the teacher should be doing, it has some big idea, the big idea, and also just some sample work that you will see throughout that uh, module. Of course, it has the PDF and also the document version that's editable, the teacher notes and the student activity, and then the TNS file. So these are specific to the CI Inspire, and they have been transformative when it comes to allowing students to make connections across grade levels. So if I were to go back to the building concepts page, there are little videos that you can watch to get an overview of those topics, and then you can learn more about building concepts. So of course, right now, we don't have enough time to go deeply into learning more, but just to show you this real quick, The progressions are outlined in a way that you can see from K through K-12 and along these domains. So you can kind of see where they line up to where your students may be or what they need. So building concepts is highly recommended, especially when you're going to be putting things on your menu where you're going to want developing students to be able to understand and come up and target some misconceptions. And then there's this classroom activity section. I utilize these a lot for proficient and advanced understanding. 
And so on the TI website, when you, go, when you go on activities, you can look at all classroom activities or you can look at 84 specific or inspire specific activities. So let's just dig into some 84 activities real quick. Um, here we'll see that there are different subjects. Each of these subjects has sub subcategories and when you click on those subcategories, you are given activities that you can utilize in your menu. So you don't have to create activities. There's so many here and it's very, very rich. Um, it's very rich content and your students are going to love the opportunity to visualize the instruction that they're receiving. This is a seven step process, um, unpacking the standards, creating the power standards, developing those proficiency skills that I talked about, designing instruction before you design, I'm sorry, designing assessments before you design instruction, and then gathering data and analyzing it. Um, I have all these resources that you can use to help you do these seven things, and I will share those with Mike. And if you want to send me an email or hit me on Twitter, then I will help you walk through them so that you can utilize this model in your classroom to help you um, better differentiate for your students in a virtual space. If you want to find out more about the restaurant classroom, you're more than welcome to check out my book. It is available on Amazon and it's also available on my website. And I look forward to talking to you more. And I thank you so much for joining in on this webinar with me and um, allowing us to get through and make things shake. My email is arieljtaylor at gmail.com. Totally should have put that on the slide. I'm sorry about that. But Mike, you got it. Thanks so much, Ariel. So as we begin wrapping things up tonight, um, if you have any last minute questions, uh, you can get those asked. And I don't think we're gonna have a ton of time to get those questions answered, but um, maybe again, reaching out to Ariel, uh, either on Twitter or by email. Uh, because I know there's probably some questions that were asked earlier that we didn't have a chance to get to uh, either as well. So you guys are asking some great questions tonight. Thank you so much. Um, I also want to mention that, so uh, Ariel mentioned that she's going to be giving me some additional documents to include. So in a couple minutes, I'm going to give you a link for the documents. Uh, hers are not going to be included in that. I will update that uh, and you'll get uh, an email in a couple of days. And that email will be uh, have a bunch of links in it, one with the certificate, one with the updated documents, uh, and one with the recording as well. So speaking of certificates, uh, to receive your certificate of attendance, go ahead and click the link in the chat window. Again, also there's a link for the documents uh, that were used tonight, uh, but Ariel is going to send me a couple more to update that. Uh, so you can feel free to download that tonight. Uh, to at least get uh, her PowerPoint uh, as well as mine. But if you want her additional documents, uh, hang tight and you'll get those in a couple of days. And if you're watching this on demand, go ahead and copy that link into your favorite browser to receive your certificate. As I mentioned, uh, you guys really did a great job tonight with the conversations and please feel free to keep those conversations going. Uh, reach out to us and reach out to Ariel uh, on Twitter or some of those other major social media outlets. If you're in need of any post webinar follow up, feel free to give us a call at 1 800 TI CARES or send us an email at ti cares at ti.com. We'd love to hear from you. Lastly, when you leave the webinar tonight, a brief survey will automatically appear in your browser. Your feedback guides us as we plan future online events, so we really hope you'll share your thoughts in the post webinar survey. Big thanks to Ariel for everything uh, you put together tonight and shared. Uh, thanks so much for everything. And thanks everyone for joining us. We hope to see you back online in a couple weeks. Have a great night. Good night.